Hi, my name is Nancy Reed and I am an associate professor and I work in part, uh, I work in the Doctorate of Medical Science program at University of Lynchburg and I'm going to be doing your block of instruction on ophthalmology disorders. This is my third um, year doing it, this block of instruction for University of Lynchburg. It's about my 11th year teaching this at various um, PA programs and I'm pretty proud to say that on when my students take the, the PANS exam, they or the PANRE exam, they generally do very well <laughs> at the end of the day um, because I think this is a pretty comprehensive course. A lot of people, um, when you go out on your clinical rotations, um, some of the people that you will rotate with um, aren't as uh, fond of eyes as I am, so hopefully you'll learn a lot in this block of instruction and you'll be able to go out on your clinical, rota on your clinical rotations with lots of confidence. So what I've done this year, uh, opposed to years past, um, since I'm not able to do these lectures live, um, I have broken the lectures down into little uh, small subsections. And so you're gonna have multiple uh, sections of lectures to watch. Some may be, you know, 20 to 30 slides, other, sections may be four or five slides. But um, I try to group the eye conditions in a way that kind of helps you stay organized in your thought process. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're just going to go over an ophthalmology review, um, review some anatomy, um, and review special tests. And then we're going to go on to eyelid disorders. We'll talk about lacrimal, lacrimal disorders and then traumatic disorders of the eye. Uh, conjunctivitis, which is something that you should be really well versed in um, before you go out on your clinical rotation. Anterior eye disorders, we're going to cover um, chronic and acute glaucoma, and we'll compare and contrast the two. We're going to talk about extraocular uh, movement disorders and how that relates to amblyopia. We'll um, discuss posterior eye disorder disorders, and we'll talk just a little bit on transient vision loss. Um, you have a handout that is um, uploaded for you, and this is a screenshot of what the handout looks like. And what I want you to do is keep this handout handy as we go through all of these modules. And I want you to write um, down what physical exam technique really gives you the diagnosis. Are there any special tests that you need to perform um, to be able to get the diagnosis? And then finally, is this eye condition an immediate referral or can it wait? And those are some of the really big things that you need to take home. A lot of times there's, there's really um, two areas. Eye conditions fall in the, you know, I can cover this, no, no problem. Or this guy needs to be seen yesterday by an ophthalmologist. So being able to identify those things that need immediate referral is very, very important in ophthalmology because a lot of times these conditions, the longer you wait, the, the more vision loss you'll have uh, if you delay treatment by not recognizing what needs an immediate referral. So before we start, we're just gonna go over a couple of things. Um, one of the main things is ophthalmology is misspelled a lot, even by medical professionals. Um, I did a lecture at a conference once and it said ophthalmology workshop and the H was missing out of it. So make sure that you have the spelling down. It's O-P-H-L-T-H-A-L-M-O-L-O-G-Y. So a lot of people forget that H um, and then sometimes they forget the L as well. So just make sure you have it spelled correctly. There are some things that you need to know. So whenever we go through this um, on, through these presentations, I'm going to talk about what you need to know for clinical practice. Um, the diagnosis, you must know how to do a good physical exam in order to get the diagnosis, but that's only half the battle. Um, you have to know how to treat the eye, and a lot of eye conditions are referred to um, an optometrist or an ophthalmologist, so you have to know when to refer. Um, I'm going to point out some things that you really need to know for your pants or pantry. 
And then I'm going to point out things that you that you need to know to keep you out of court. And that's really when to refer and when not to refer. And you're going to be tested by me a lot. Um, I'm going to have active learning things uh, built into the presentations. So just make sure you're paying uh, a lot of attention. I hate that we're not in an in-class um, setting because I really do ask a lot of questions uh, as part of my lectures and make it really interactive and fun. But I'm going to try to do my best um, with the recorded lectures. So let's start with the review. Um, we're going to talk about the external eye, the internal eye, and we're going to talk about physical exam. And as part of physical exam, we're going to talk about refractive errors, which really are not um, taken care of or are covered in medical practices. Optometrists usually take care of most of those issues, but you do have to have some baseline understanding of refractive errors. And then we're going to talk about all the um, special tests that you probably did not learn um, in physical diagnosis, but you may be able to perform while you're out on clinical rotations. So um, first thing we're going to do is just kind of go over some high points of the external anatomy. I'm not going to go over every single solitary um, anatomical structure, but I did want to add these pictures in and this information in um, so you can refer back to it at any point in time if you're you know, not clear about something I'm talking about. So um, the medial epi, or the medial canthus um, is the medial medi section of the eye, as you can see um, by the picture here. And the lateral, uh, uh, um, lateral canthus is obviously clearly the lateral side. So the sclera um, is uh, covered by the conjunctiva. So the sclera is the white portion, and the conjunctiva is the clear or sometimes can become red um, when it's inflamed um, section of the eye. And then you have two types of conjunctiva. You have the bulbar conjunctiva, which covers the sclera, and you have the palpebral conjunctiva that covers the inside of the eyelids. So the palpebral conjunctiva is really um, important because the only way you can examine that is by flipping the eyelid uh, inside out. So the iris is the pigmented um, muscle of the eye. It controls the amount of light going into the retina by um, muscles called the uh, sphincter um, and the dilator um, pupil. Those muscles uh, make the, the pupil larger and smaller. So when the pupil becomes small, less light is entered the eye. When the pupil becomes larger, more um, light enters the eye. And the limbus is the junction of the sclera with the cornea. And this is a very, very important um, area to take note of because a lot of um, conditions do not pass the limbic line. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through. But that limbus is, again, the junction of the sclera and the cornea. So the cornea is the clear part of the, of the eye. Um, it is avascular. The mabobian glands secrete oil and keep tears from evaporating quickly, um, and they can be found in the eyelids. You have the levator palpebra, which elevates the eyelid and is controlled by cranial nerve number three. And the obicularis oculi um, surrounds the eyelids and closes the eye and is controlled by cranial nerve number seven. So what I always do is I open my eyes real big and I say three, and then I close them real tight and I say seven. Big, three, tight, seven. And it just kind of helps drive home and keep in mind those cranial nerves. And the cranial nerves are very, very important, especially uh, clinically they are important for sure. Um, but from a standpoint of pants and pantry, a good majority of the ophthalmology um, t uh, test questions, if you just have a firm understanding of the cranial nerves um, that, that impact the eye, then you can get a lot of the questions right if you know nothing else other than the cranial nerves. The lacrimal apparatus is very important as well <clears throat> because if the lacrimal apparatus isn't working properly, you can have a drying of the eyes 
and the lacrimal apparatus can also become infected and be a source of uh, issues for um, really all ages, but young children um, and 40 and over get infections of the lacrimal system. So the lacrimal gland is found um, just above the upper lid, um, kind of buried in the orbit, and it will uh, release tears, and the tears then soak over the eye and hydrate the eye, and then they will eventually get caught in the trough of the lower lid, and that's kind of um, what keeps the moisture around the eye. So you blink and the, the moisture that's trapped in the bottom uh, of the lower lid will then be swept back over the eye when the eyelids open back up. If you get too much fluid in the eye and it needs to be drained, it will drain through the puncta, which you can see there are, um, <clears throat> the, the puncta, there are two puncta clearly because of gravity, the lower puncta is gonna do the vast majority of the draining. So the tears drain into the puncta and then through the uh, caniculi and then into the lacrimal sac. Um, the lacrimal sac is within the bony orbit and then the tears will then drain into the nasolacrimal duct and um, that's the whole pathway of tears. It's really important that you understand that. You have accessory tear glands in the eyelids and conjunctiva as well. <clears throat> so here we go, cranial nerves. These cranial nerves are super, super important. Um, I'm sure you guys have probably heard of, um, heard how important that the knowledge of this is for clinical questions, but we're going to go over it. So the superior rectus muscle is controlled by cranial nerve number three. So the superior rectus muscle will move the eye superiorly. Inferior rectus muscle is located on the bottom of the eyeball and it moves it inferiorly. And then medial and lateral rectus so medial rectus is three, and here's your outlier. The lateral rectus is controlled by cranial nerve six. So all the rectus muscles are three except for lateral, which is six. Now, the superior oblique is controlled by cranial nerve four, and the inferior oblique is controlled by cranial nerve three. So not that you have to memorize these numbers, but it's gonna come into play a little bit later with the extraocular uh, uh, muscle disorders. The rectus muscles are inserted on the eyeball at a um, pretty regular distance um, from the pupil and the iris. So if you see here, the lateral rectus is about seven millimeters um, from the uh, edge of the uh, pupil and the medial rectus is 5.5. So that becomes important because if these muscles get offset, what happens is it pulls the eye either one direction or the other, and then the eyes are not um, setting in the same direction as each other. And when eyes don't work together, the, the brain does not like that, and it will shut off um, the eye that's causing double vision. And so when the eyes are not properly aligned, both eyes aren't pointing in the same direction, what will happen is you will experience double vision. <clears throat> the other important thing that I want to point out is with the oblique muscles is the oblique muscles are named for where they attach on the eye, not what they do. So the superior oblique muscle is attaches on the superior portion of the eye, but it actually moves the eye inferiorly. And the inferior oblique attaches um, low on the inferior portion of the eye, but moves the eye um, superiorly. So again, this is just another, um, uh, another wrap up of the eyes. And I think it's really important is you see the superior oblique and the inferior oblique. Um, the inferior oblique moves the eye up and nasally and the superior oblique moves it down and nasally. And the rest are um, pretty much what you would expect. The medial rectus moves the eye medially, the lateral rectus um, moves the 
eye temporally and the superior rectus moves it up in temporally and inferior rectus moves it down in temporally. So obliques go nasally and rectus muscles, the superior and inferior rectus muscles moves it temporally. So <clears throat> um, just again, it's just, you gotta, you gotta get this straight in your mind because otherwise you're gonna have problems later because when we start talking about um, muscles in the eye that are paralyzed, you have to understand these things to understand what muscle is being paralyzed. So the circulation of aqueous humor is really important when we start talking about uh, acute angle glaucoma. You have to understand what the, um, the order is. And so a, aqueous humor is um, produced by ciliary bodies and it drains into the anterior chamber, into this area, and then it moves through the anterior chamber, through the, pu or, through the posterior chamber, through the pupil, and then into the anterior chamber. And when it moves into the anterior chamber, it will then drain through the trabecular meshwork, out the uh, canal schlem, and into um, circulation. So if there's any imbalance in this system, what will happen is fluid will build up, this aqueous humor will build up, and start to cause pressure on the eye. So we're going to talk about interocular pressure, and you hear people say, oh, their pressure's going up. It's because something is going on with the ciliary body um, production. Maybe they're overproducing, or maybe they're having a draining problem, and the fluid can't get out the trabecular meshwork and out the canal of Schlem. So one of the things that I'm going to ask you um, from a test, test question standpoint is what's the order of the circulation of aqueous humor? So you're going to have to say made in ciliary bodies, goes into the posterior chamber, through the pupil, into the anterior chamber, out the trabecular meshwork, out the canal of Schlem, and into circulation. So it's very, very important to understand this in order to grasp um, acute angle glaucoma. So the interior um, eye anatomy, um, you see this whenever you do an, op, um, an ophthalmologic um, retinal exam. And so the inner layer is the choroid layer. Um, the middle layer is the choroid layer. The inner layer is the uh, retina. And the retina senses the light. There's aqueous humor um, in the back of the eye. And that's the gel that gives the eye, shape, uh, the eye its shape. The optic disc is the posterior pole of the retina, and on physical exam, it's usually yellowish or pink um, in nature, and it is the head of the optic nerve. Central um, retinal veins and arteries come off of that area. You have a physiological cup. That's the center of the optic disc, and it should occupy about 30% of the disc diameter. A macula has no um, vessels and it's the keen vision. And the fovea uh, is the center of the macula where all the cones are located. Um, the lens is behind the iris and it sh changes shape by the ciliary bodies and the muscles. So when you're looking through, you look through the lens and if there's something wrong with that lens, such as a cataract where it's foggy, you're not gonna be able to see the back of the eye. So the lens really is the opening to being able to see the back of the eye. So again, here's just a picture of the items that I went back over. And again, this is just um, a review. Uh, so when we start talking about conditions, you will understand. So I just want to point out a couple of things here. Um, here is the optic disc, and you can see that all the arteries and veins originate off of that. Um, the fovea is this pale colored region, um, and then the disc to cup ratio is about 30. You want the physiologic disc to occupy about 30% of the entire um, width of the optic disc. And again, here's a little bit, a, a close-up of the disc, um, the fovea, and then the veins and the arteries. And you will see um, in this picture that, that veins in the eye are larger than arteries. 
So in the rest of the body, it's the other way around. Arteries are typically larger and thicker than veins, but in the eye, the veins will appear larger and the arteries will appear smaller. So on physical exam, the first thing that you always want to do on physical exam is the visual acuity. And in, in generally, um, a tech will be doing your visual acuity for you if you work in a, in a normal size clinic. If you're super, super small, maybe you're the one doing it. But you have to make sure that your techs understand how to do a visual acuity exam. You need to do a visual acuity exam with and without glasses or contacts. And you really should do near and far vision. Near vision specifically for those around 40 or older because you start having loss of near vision about that time because of hardening of the lens. Then the next thing you want to do is you want to do inspection. Um, you want to just look at the person's eyes, look at the eyelids, um, look at the area um, where the lacrimal system would um, be underlying. You're going to do pupil function. You're going to inspect the pupils. You're going to see how it re reacts to light. You're going to look at near reaction, which is um, also called accommodation. And you're going to check to make sure that the pupils are equal round reactive to light. You're going to look at ocular mobility by testing the EOMs. And you're going to do a convergence test. And that's where you um, have the person follow your finger in and you move the finger closer to the nose and the eyes should come together. Um, in a uh, routine fashion, both eyes should move inward to the tip of the nose. We're going to talk more about cover uncover test and cover cross cover test, which you may or may not have previously done in a physical exam lab. And we're also gonna talk about Hirschberg's corneal light test. Um, and all of those come into play um, when we start talking about strabismus. And we're, we'll show you how to do those um, via a video. Um, visual field testing, we're looking for loss of peripheral vision. Anterior chamber test is looking to see if there is an excess buildup of aqueous humor in the anterior chamber. And then finally, you're gonna do a fundoscopic exam, which includes looking for a red reflex. So let's talk a little bit about refractive errors. So if somebody has um, normal vision, it's called emetropia. That means they have perfect vision 2020. Um, presbyopia is a condition um, that usually happens um, around age 40, you'll, you'll start to see the effects of it, but the hardening of the lens actually starts in the early 20s. And what happens is that lens becomes hard with age, it's less pliable, and the patient loses the ability to make the lens rounder, and it leads to progressive decrease in vision loss. So um, they also have decreased in, in accommodation and these people will typically wear bifocals. Nowadays, um, people, you used to be able to see the little lines on people's glasses and you could see, oh, they have bifocals, um, they're having issues with near vision. But nowadays, glasses come with called, what's called progressive lenses and that line is gone. So it's hard to tell just by looking at somebody's eyes if they have, um, if they wear glasses for presbyopia as well. So myopia is a difficulty seeing far away. You, you can see very clear up close, but it, um, images in the distance are blurry. The light focuses in front of the retina and the distant image is blurred. And the reason why this happens is that um, the eyeball is too long. So it's really important to remember that myopia, the eyeball is too long. And we're gonna talk about conditions um, that af affect people who have uh, myopic eyes, and it's important to understand that. Hyperopia is a difficulty seeing up close, and they're farsighted. And the reason this happens is because the light rays focus behind the retina. And the close images are blurry. And this eye is too short, and the cornea is flat. So here's an example of a normal eye. The light um, comes in the eye and goes through the lens and focuses perfectly on the back of the retina. In a myoptic eye, the eyeball is too long and so the light ray focuses before the retina 
and in hyperoptic eye, the eye is too short and the focus um, hits behind where the retina is. So oftentimes you'll hear people say, well, I have an astigmatism. And an astigmatism is an error in the focusing ability of the eye. And light is not uniformly focused in all directions. So when it goes through um, the cornea, the, the light kind of scatters. And this causes is caused by an unequal curvature on the front surface of the cornea. So the cornea is not spherical. So um, they may see images like you see on the left-hand side there. So we're going to talk about some special tests now. These are some things that you probably did not talk about in physical diagnosis lab, um, but you will see and do when you go out um, on your clinical rotations. So we're going to talk about fluorescein stain, uh, tonometry, Humphrey's visual field test, Ishihara's test for color blindness, slit lamp, and then dilation of pupils. So fluorescein stain, what we do is we typically numb up the eye and then in, you, as you see this little applicator up here in the right hand corner, you will hold on to the white end of that eye and you will touch the orange end on the eye. And what happens is that's a dye and the person will blink and that dye will spread across the surface of the eye. So if there's any break in the um, epithelium, the penetration of fluorescein stain um, goes through it and then the dye makes contact with an alkaline interstitial fluid and that fluid turns bright green. So whenever you light it up with a black light, you will see this bright green. So what you're seeing here on the image on the right is a corneal abrasion. Those are scratches in the cornea and you can see that that fluorescein stain was picked up by those scratches. Tonometry, tonometry checks the interocular pressure of the eye. So normal interocular pressure is about 10 to 20 millimeters per mercury. It varies based on the reference that you look at. Um, some people will say it's 12, some people will say it's 13, some people will say it's 20. Um, so that number kind of varies depending on the source. So if you just kind of keep in mind 10 to 20 for tonometry. So you have um, a thing called a tono pin and the tonal pin actually you touch the eye. You numb up the eye and you touch the end of the pin on the eye and you get the average of three readings. They also have what's called non-contact tonometry and that's also what we call the puff test and it um, measures how hard or soft the eye is. The harder the eye, the more air that's reflected, the softer the eye, the less air that's reflected. So when an eye becomes um, uh, overfilled with aqueous humor, that anterior chamber fills up and it becomes very, very high. So you're going to get a, a lot of air reflecting off on that puff test. So that's called tonometry. Um, you, in an ER setting, you're going to see tonal pins used more often. In an op, uh, optometry or ophthalmology setting, you're going to see that non-contact tonometry. So Humphrey Visual Fields Test is a um, test that you send somebody for if you think that they're losing their peripheral vision. And what it does, it will flash lights in the peripheral region and it will map what areas um, you're not seeing. So um, this visual fields test that you see um, below, the there was the dark boxes um, indicate mist blinks of light. So there's little blinks of light that show up and you hit the button every time you see it in that area in the upper um, left hand corner. Those are were the people, the person could not see that region. So they had a visual field loss in their um, upper uh, outer region. So this is what they do if you suspect someone is having a visual field deficits. Slit lamp is a binocular microscope which shows three dimensions of the eye. It's used to inspect the anterior segments of the eye. So keep that in mind, it's the anterior segments. You're not going to be looking at the back of the eye with this. You're going to be looking at the front, the front portions of the eye, um, like the cornea, the sclera, the anterior chamber, and you'll be able to see back to about the lens. Um, so you will see slit lamp usage a lot in an emergency room setting. Um, slit lamps are um, 
kind of hard to get used to using. So if you're doing an ER rotation and you, you don't have any patients and you have a chance to go in and play with the slit, slit lamp, have somebody go in and, and sit down in front of the slit lamp and work with it. The only way you get good at a slit lamp exam is by doing it, you know, multiple times. So this is called an Ishihara's test for color blindness. So uh, you can do a, the small colorblind test on a Snellen chart. There's the red line and the green line. So you can always ask the patient, you know, what color do you see here? Uh, is it red? Or they can say red or green. But this is a more comprehensive test than that. And what you'll do is there's um, usually 11 plates. So the top portion here is a plate. The bottom portion is a, is a second plate. And you ask the patient, what number do you see? And they should say six and 12. Uh, and you annotate how many plates that they missed. So they, they missed two of 14 plates. And it's a more extensive test for colorblindness. If you work in an occupational medicine setting, you will use the Ishihara test quite frequently because we need people like truck drivers to be able to know um, colors for like stoplights. We also need our firefighters, our policemen, and those kind of things, um, pilots. So you'll, you'll use the Ishihara color test uh, a lot if you work in an occupational medicine setting. So finally, we're gonna talk about dilation of the eye. So in physical exam lab, um, you remember you got your ophthalmoscope out and you were looking in the back of the eye and you were telling us what all you were visualizing, but you really had a hard time visualizing anything. Well, there's a reason for that. The um, pupil, uh, the undilated pupil, only lets a small portion of light in. If you dilate the pupil, it lets a lot more light in and you're able to visualize the back of the eye to include the retina and the optic nerve. So um, you get um, a much better view of the retina in a dilated eye. Um, we don't typically dilate eyes on a, on a routine basis in a, um, academic setting because you can have some um, issues with dilating people's eyes and we don't want that risk. So you will learn more about dilating eyes when you're out on clinical rotation. So let's just do a little quick review. I always tell my students, if you can remember this slide, um, you are going to be golden for a good majority of your um, pants and pan questions. So a review of cranial nerves for the eye. Cranial nerve three opens the eye um, via the levator palpebral and the pupil is constricted by cranial nerve three. So I always tell people if the eye won't open or if there's something wrong with the pupil, it's cranial nerve three until proven otherwise. Cranial nerve seven closes the eye and cranial nerve seven is also uh, responsible for tear production. So if you have somebody come in and they're complaining of dry eyes, you have to think that there may be something going on with cranial nerve seven. There's other reasons for dry eyes, but you always have to have something, uh, an issue with cranial nerve seven on your differential diagnosis. And then the one thing we haven't talked about yet is cranial nerve two transmits the visual images um, from the retina to the brain. So uh, cranial nerve two is respons responsible for your visual acuity. And one of the things you've probably heard um, while you were um, going through um, the last year of school is the saying LR6 SO4, the rest are three. So the, that's a little acronym to help remember the um, extraocular, uh, extraocular muscles. So the lateral rectus is innervated by cranial nerve six. The superior, superior oblique is um, innervated by four and all the rest of those muscles are innervated by cranial nerve three. Also keep in mind the oblique muscles are named for where they attach on the eye, not how they move the eye. And if the lid or pupil is involved, and the eye is down and out, it's cranial nerve three until proven otherwise.